Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, 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 lecture uh, of the project Perizia. Uh, this lecture uh, is part of uh, uh, our uh, series of public lectures organized uh, by Maria Bagramian uh, in Dublin uh, on trust in an age of disinformation and also part of, uh, uh, as a, let's say, as a keynote speech of uh, the, conf the, the workshop we organized with Teresa Branch Smith in October on social indicator of trust at uh, Institut Unico in Paris. Actually, all these uh, locations are virtual because everything was on Zoom. I mean, it, the, the, we uh, were supposed to organize in Paris the, the actual conference with Mark uh, Alfano and Dan Sperber and Christina Bicchieri as a keynote speaker here in Paris, but uh, everything was uh, moved to uh, on online, as you know very well. <laughs> uh, and so we have the pleasure today to have Mark Alfano, uh, from Macquarie, uh, associate professor at Macquarie University in uh, Australia, uh, who uh, kindly accepted to, to, to give uh, his uh, keynote uh, speech uh, in uh, by this uh, 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 through this format. And actually, I thank uh, a lot all the all the team of Perizia, and in particular Maria Bagramia, who uh, helped us uh, uh, advertise this uh, uh, lecture within uh, the broader framework of uh, lecture uh, that uh, we had through the months of uh, April and May in Perizia. So Mark is uh, um, professor of philosophy at Macquarie University. He uses tools from, uh, uh, and methods from philosophy, psychology, and uh, computer science to explore topics in social epistemology, moral psychology, and uh, digital humanities. He and his co-authors uh, were also the winners of the first Peritia Essay Prize. So this is it's very nice to have him back uh, uh, involved in the Peritia uh, project. And he's editing a, a volume on social virtue epistemology that will come out with uh, Routleg this year. Uh, and uh, uh, today, uh, he's gonna uh, talk uh, about trusting wisely with, uh, within social and digital networks. And uh, as always within these lectures, uh, uh, you can use the Q&A function uh, tool in order to ask questions. And Mark will talk uh, for about uh, uh, 40 minutes, I think, and then we will have the time to uh, dedicate some time to, to the Q&A. Uh, uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Mark, please, the floor is yours. And I just stop my video. Great, so I'll share my screen. Um, I think somebody needs to stop sharing theirs first. Thanks. Uh, here we go. Try that again. Excellent. Thanks for your patience. Um, and I apologize if I'm a little bit incoherent because it's um, it's just after one in the morning here. So um, I've, I've stayed up rather late for this. Uh, the title of the talk for today is uh, Trusting Wisely in Social uh, and Digital Networks. And basically what I'm going to do is walk you through some of the results of a few different collaborative projects that I've either um, recently published or which are currently under, um, under peer review, um, because I think that together they tell an interesting story about what it takes for us both as individuals and as uh, communities to trust wisely. And now let's see if I can advance my screen. Yeah, so um, many of you will be familiar with this um, important paper by Honora O'Neill, uh, linking trust to trustworthiness. Uh, and in this paper, she essentially argues that 
we should not view trust as an unmitigated good where sort of the more of it, the better in the way that say potentially pleasure is, is uh, often viewed at least in a utilitarian framework. Um, she rather argues that trust needs to be well-placed uh, and she points to some difficulties with the ways in which trust is often measured in uh, the social sciences because uh, in the social sciences, in many cases, people will be asked things like, how much do you trust the average person or strangers or um, the medical sector or government or big business or universities or whatever it might be? Um, and sh she suggests, I think with some reason that um, people need to be given something a bit more specific if they're asked to make this assessment of trust, because that means that they need to figure out whether the entity, whether it's an individual or say an institution or a bureaucracy that they're being invited to trust or report their level of trust in uh, is genuinely trustworthy. Uh, so uh, it's sort of a trustworthiness uh, first kind of account. And I think that this is on the right track um, and it sort of suggests a maxim. Uh, th this is a, maybe a bit more extreme than what she says in a paper, but we might extract uh, something like this uh, as at least a good rule of thumb from the paper, uh, namely that um, X should trust Y with Z um, only if, oh, great, I already made a mistake, only if Y is uh, trustworthy with respect to Z, so that um, that Z in the middle right there should be a Y, right? So the, the idea is that you can trust some people with some things, you can trust some institutions with some things and maybe also not with others. So for instance, um, you should not trust me to pilot you around in a plane, but uh, I can assure you that if, uh, if you were my neighbor and you asked me to take care of your pet for the weekend while you were out of town, you could trust me to, to keep your pet alive, uh, right? So that third position, the Z position, uh, indicates the sort of domain or object uh, in which trust is, um, is being placed. Now, I think that this is a plausible maxim, but I also think that it is too strong in uh, a number of ways. So I would add uh, at least five caveats to this, uh, and these will be a bit relevant later on. So one of them is uh, to do with loss aversion. So loss aversion is this phenomenon that occurs where people feel the loss of a resource um, more keenly than they enjoy gaining it. So people uh, feel worse losing $5 than they feel good gaining $5. Uh, and so if you're thinking about trusting something, somebody with something, uh, either trusting their word or trusting them to do something uh, or to take care of something, uh, then you inevitably are making yourself vulnerable uh, and in particular vulnerable to the loss of whatever it is that you've entrusted them with. If you're not a particularly loss averse person, you can afford to trust a bit more recklessly uh, or a bit more generously, one might say. Um, and one's level of loss aversion is often going to depend on how much they can safely lose. So obviously, if you're trusting someone with your life, uh, then uh, that's, uh, that's something that can lead to a catastrophic loss that's the same for everyone, sort of infinite loss. But if you're trusting someone with $100 and they don't pay you back, well, then it's really going to make a big difference whether you can easily cope with that loss or not. And so you might think that someone who has more resources should actually consider them consider violating what I'm here calling O'Neill's maxim uh, and trusting even when they're not totally sure that the object of their trust is trustworthy because they can afford the loss and the potential gain to the person that they are trusting, <coughs> say by giving them a loan, um, is, is great enough to make that, uh, that risk worth it. There's an interesting example of this in, uh, in the book Kitchen Confidential, where this cook who, um, Anthony Bourdain, you may have heard of uh, as a celebrity chef who uh, sadly killed himself um, 
a, a couple of years ago, um, where he was strung out on cocaine uh, and he was offered a job by uh, this restaurant manager. And he says like, I was sure that this guy didn't really trust me, but he was willing to sort of go out on a limb for me. And that made such a huge difference for my life that, um, that, I, that I got off, uh, got off the drugs. Um, also sort of caveat for O'Neill, uh, risk aversion is related to, to loss aversion. So I won't go through it in as much detail, but it has to do more with probabilities. Um, the third uh, relates to that uh, thing, story I just mentioned from Anthony Bourdain. Uh, and this is something that's come up in the philosophical literature on trust, which has to do with how trust can sometimes be what's sometimes called therapeutic, meaning that you can put your trust in someone in a way that you demonstrate to them and in so doing, induce them to become more trustworthy than they'd previously otherwise been. Uh, so people like uh, Victoria McGeer and Philip Pettit have written about this. I've written about this myself. It seems to work through a variety of mechanisms. One is that people enjoy the esteem that comes with being trusted. Um, <coughs> sorry. Another is that um, therapeutic trust can sort of change someone's self-concept and people enjoy acting in accordance with their self-concept. But if you think that therapeutic trust sometimes is effective, then maybe sometimes you should violate O'Neill's maxim as I'm calling it here. Sorry about my voice. Uh, the fourth reason uh, that you might sometimes violate this maxim has to do with the fact that trusting can be seen as a form of inquiry. And this is something that Jason DeCruz has pointed out in a recent paper. So the basic idea here is that there's an asymmetry when it comes to trust and distrust. If you put your trust in me, then either I'm going to prove trustworthy or not. Either way, you find out something about me, which can be useful for you and also for you to tell other people about me uh, in the future. Whereas if you don't put your trust in me, for instance, you don't let me take care of your cat while you're out of town, um, then you'll never get to find out what would have happened in the counterfactual scenario where you did trust me. Uh, and that means that you'll never find out information that could be useful for you in the future. So again, if you, you're able to sustain a certain level of loss, then trusting as a form of inquiry can actually be quite valuable, uh, even if the person that you're putting your trust in is not someone that you are certain is going to prove trustworthy. <clears throat> and then the fifth caveat has to do with something that I'm going to talk about quite a bit uh, in the rest of this lecture, which has to do with um, the, the social context um, having an effect on whether someone is liable to prove trustworthy. So the way O'Neill sort of talks about it in her paper, at least as I read it, um, individuals are sort of meant to be assessed on how trustworthy they are in a vacuum. Um, and I think that this is a misleading way of understanding how we trust each other because the same person in one social context may be disposed to prove trustworthy, whereas in a different social context where for instance, <coughs> they're not being observed, um, might not be disposed to prove trustworthy. This is something that Nietzsche remarks upon in Human All Too Human. <coughs> where he says that rapid progress in the sciences is possible only when the individual is not obliged to be too mistrustful in the testing of every account and assertion made by others in domains in which he's relative stranger. The condition for this, however, says Nietzsche, is that in his own field, everyone must have rivals who are extremely mistrustful and are accustomed to observe him very closely. So it's out of this juxtaposition of not too mistrustful and extremely mistrustful that the integrity of the Republic of the Learned, as he puts it, originates. <clears throat> I think this is a nice way of sort of uh, characterizing at least how peer review, peer review is meant to work. It's not clear that peer review always does work in this way, but this is essentially the idea behind um, academic peer review that you've got the uh, ability to trust uh, when you're not an expert because you know that other people who actually are experts have vetted um, what's being said. 
Um, and that's a, a scenario in which you're sort of violating what I'm calling O'Neill's maxim here, because you're not in a position to assess whether the, at least not directly, whether the speaker, uh, the, the person who's written, for instance, uh, an academic article um, is, uh, is actually trustworthy, but you're instead putting your trust in the system of peer review and fact checking uh, to ensure to uh, ensure that for you. So it's trusting uh, in in an institution rather than uh, an individual. Okay, so that I think points us to some ways in which to start thinking about what it means to trust wisely. It's not going to be a totally individualistic matter where for each utterance that each person addresses to me, inviting my trust, inviting me to believe them, for instance, I have to <clears throat> individually decide, is this person trustworthy in this domain with respect to me as a trustee? <clears throat> Instead, uh, what we're going to do is rely on a lot of social and institutional cues to help us make that, that kind of judgment in a more heuristic way. And this leads to uh, the way that I've been approaching trust for the last few years, um, namely that there are sort of two interlocking approaches to trusting wisely. On the one hand, uh, I as an individual can try to cultivate dispositions that function as epistemic virtues given my socio-technical context. So given the fact that say I'm on Twitter or on Facebook or that I've got links to the New York Times or that I'm watching YouTube videos or that I am watching presidential press conferences or whatever it might be, given that th those are the affordances that are available to me, different dis dispositions may be differentially um, associated with my acquisition of knowledge and avoidance of error. <clears throat> and then turning things around, if we assume that, okay, maybe human nature is not entirely malleable, then there are going to be some typical dispositions that a lot of people display. Um, and if we know that populations tend to have a range of these dispositions, then we should think about how best to transform the socio-technical context so that those dispositions count as epistemic virtues uh, given the transformed socio-technical context. So let me show you a few examples of how I've been trying to approach these uh, sort of uh, twin, um, uh, twin maxims. Uh, the first is a dispositional approach uh, and it's a study of epistemic vice that I've done with Marco Meyer and Badevine de Brown. Uh, we developed a pair of scales, um, one of epistemic indifference and one of epistemic rigidity, which uh, together we call the epistemic vice scale. Uh, this has quite good psychometric properties. So basically what we do is we invite people to look at each of these sentences and tell us to what extent they agree or disagree with them. So the indifference ones include things like, I don't much enjoy gaining knowledge. I'm not very interested in understanding things. Uh, and the rigidity ones have to do with things like, uh, I tend to be too confident. Uh, I tend to make decisions based on my gut. So together these form a, a sort of cluster of epistemic vices where, where people uh, don't really care about the reasons why they might believe something. And then once they've made their minds up, they don't change their minds. Um, and what we've shown is that these uh, dispositions are highly predictive of whether people accept a range of medical misinformation about the pandemic. So this is a summary statistics. This is the percentage of total participants out of about 1,750 participants who agreed with each of them. So we've got roughly one out of every five people uh, agrees with each of these, um, these pieces of medical misinformation. Um, but if you look at the correlation between medical misinformation acceptance and a very wide range of dispositions that have been studied in uh, in psychology, what you find is that epistemic vice is the most highly correlated uh, with acceptance of, of medical misinformation. So this value of 7.6 here, that, that's a correlation, that's a 0.76 positive correlation. Um, that's uh, about as high as you ever see in personality psychology. 
uh, and both the indifference and the rigidity scales uh, contribute to that. Uh, other scales that you might be familiar with, like open-mindedness, like the cognitive reflection task, like need for closure, like trust in experts, all of these also correlate with um, acceptance of medical misinformation and usually in the direction you would expect, but the correlation is much weaker. So this suggests that we have a way of measuring something that tells us a lot about um, what people are disposed to do when, when uh, medical misinformation rears its ugly head. Um, this is just a different representation of the, the same um, information. So basically the, the closer you are to red here, the more pieces of misinformation you accept. And what we're seeing is that there's a small but non-trivial number of people who score high on both rigidity and indifference. And they're the ones who drive uh, almost the entire effect. So moral of the story, don't jump to conclusions and ref refuse to change your mind. Um, the, uh, the next study that I wanna show you uh, uses a different scale. This is an open-mindedness scale that my team developed a few years ago. And what you're seeing here are the items along with their factor loadings. Um, I can get into the details of that later if you're interested. But basically people who uh, agree with statements like, um, I feel no shame learning from someone who knows more than me, count as open-minded on this uh, measure. And people who disagree and say, <clears throat> no, only, only wimps admit that they've made mistakes. Those people will, um, people who agree with that statement will end up scoring low on the open-mindedness scale. So we've got some that are negatively loaded, some that are positively loaded. <clears throat> so here's the results. I'm sorry for the huge graph. Uh, here's the results of a very large study that we conducted last year with over 45,000 participants in um, 86 countries. Uh, and what we found was that open-mindedness was the single strongest predictor of conspiracy beliefs about COVID-19. So these would include things like that it was a bioweapon, that it was um, that it is caused by 5G cell networks uh, and a range of other conspiracy theories. Um, and open-mindedness is also among the strongest predictors of um, three other outcome variables, namely people's self-reported physical contact, so uh, the degree to which they were, say, staying at home, uh, their physical hygiene, so the degree to which they're, say, washing their hands more, uh, and their support for a range of policies like lockdowns. So open-mindedness turns out to be um, an extremely uh, valuable predictor of a range of important outcomes. Um, it's not as strong a predictor as the epistemic vice scale, um, but this is also a much larger study from uh, a much larger number of uh, uh, populations. Just to put that in context, we ran a multivariate uh, analysis of this, uh, and what you're seeing here are the associations of open-mindedness and a bunch of other predictors with each of the four main uh, outcome variables. So for instance, open-mindedness is the strongest predictor of reporting that you are staying at home. Um, in fact, it's almost twice as strong as anything else. Uh, the next closest is national identity. It's also among the strongest predictors of uh, report, self-reported physical hygiene, so things like washing your hands, um, and uh, it's essentially tied for second or third with a few others. The, the top one here is, um, is belonging, so a sense of social belonging. Um, it is the single strongest predictor uh, of uh, policy support, again, by a fair margin. Um, and it's also the, the, the strongest predictor of rejection of conspiracy beliefs. Um, and you may be familiar with the cognitive reflection task, that's CRT here. Uh, Open-mindedness beats the CRT on every single measure uh, in, in this very large study. So I, I think that what we're seeing in this study and the previous one uh, is that um, open-mindedness uh, and sort of its opposite epistemic vice are strongly predictive of the, the highly relevant health-related beliefs and atti other attitudes that people 
adopt in an emergency situation such as the, the ongoing pandemic. Right, so that's what I just said. Um, turning now to the structural approach, uh, we were just looking in the previous stuff at individuals and their self-reported attitudes, um, we can instead look at how people are connected to each other and how the patterns of trust among them uh, may warp their concerns, values, and attitudes. So at the same time that we were doing all the stuff that I just mentioned, we were also monitoring Twitter for discussion of um, vac vaccines and immunizations. Uh, and we used um, social network analysis, specifically the construction of um, a retweet network uh, to identify the main communities involved in this discussion. Uh, we were looking primarily at English language um, uh, uh, discourse, uh, but not restricting it to the United States. Nevertheless, almost all of the top accounts that we found were from the US. Uh, as you can see by looking at the names of some of the representative nodes here, not all of them, but many of them. Uh, so we found, for instance, that about um, uh, about a quarter uh, of the the nodes uh, in this network um, were essentially identified with the center left in in the United States and its allies abroad. Um, about eighteen percent with uh, Republicans. Uh, about 13% with public health in some way. So you see the World Health Organization, the CDC, uh, and so on. Um, about 8% with anti-vaxxers and another 16% with a harder to define group that includes some socialists, uh, comedian, um, uh, Jacobin Magazine, Dr. Tedros, who's associated with World, World Health Organization, uh, and so on. Uh, and one thing to note here is the level of signal boosting that uh, each of these communities benefited from. So while Democrats were the largest group, um, they didn't get the largest amount of attention uh, that went to Republicans. And they didn't get the highest level of signal boosting that went to anti-vaxxers. And that's because what essentially happened was that prior to COVID already, um, the anti-vaxxers and the Republicans had formed a kind of mutually exploitative relationship. And that was because <clears throat> anti-vaxxers uh, were getting their content moderated for spreading medical misinformation. So for instance, if your account consistently put out tweets that said things like vaccines cause autism, uh, then your account would eventually get shut down. Um, so what they did was they switched to saying things that related, uh, at least in the first instance, not to um, descriptive and causal claims, but to value claims. So they would say, it's my choice whether to get vaccinated. It's my choice as a parent, whether my kids get vaccinated and I love freedom and you can't make me do things. Um, and that, that kind of um, extreme libertarian approach to freedom um, put them in league with Republicans, who then once um, COVID hit, um, sort of flooded the scene uh, and amplified both themselves uh, and the anti-vaxxers that they had already made common cause with. Now, one thing that we can do on top of the, that sort of social network analysis is to look at the language that people are actually using. So what you're seeing here is um, a pair of dendrograms um, that use uh, the, the dictionaries from what's called linguistic inquiry and word count, which is um, a method of analyzing text that was developed by James Pennebaker, who's a psychologist at University of Texas, Austin. Uh, it's a fairly simple-minded kind of linguistic analysis. So basically all you do is you define some dictionaries uh, by listing words uh, and then you count what percentage of a corpus is words from a particular dictionary. So for instance, you might be interested in um, what percentage of words use the first person singular. So I, me, my, uh, myself. Or you might be interested in what proportion of words in a corpus use, um, use the first person plural. So we, us, our, ourselves. Um, there are over a hundred uh, 
uh, pre-validated Luke dictionaries um, that uh, Pennebaker and his colleagues have been working on for a couple of decades, and they've shown that these can predict quite a few things. Um, we use those dictionaries to compare uh, the language used in these five communities um, and specifically found that prior to the pandemic, um, despite the fact that they didn't agree about much of anything, uh, Republicans, Democrats, and this sort of unorthodox quasi-socialist group <clears throat> largely use the same language. So that suggests that maybe they disagreed, but they kind of agreed about what concerns were relevant, even if they disagreed about how to address those concerns. Likewise, um, public health and anti-vaxxers also tended to use more of the same language as each other than they did with any of the political groups. But what happened uh, when the pandemic struck was that actually there was a reshuffle and sh public health and Democrats on the one hand started to use the same language as each other, uh, whereas uh, Republicans and, and anti-vaxxers started to use the same language as each other. Uh, and our interpretation of this, um, at least uh, based on what we've seen so far, is that that was based on this pre-existing mutually exploitative kind of trust uh, relationship between anti-vaxxers and Republicans. They were already allies. And so uh, when, uh, when the shit hit the fan, um, they, they pulled together, not just in terms of um, supporting each other, but actually in terms of expressing the same concerns as each other. <clears throat> and we did this same analysis, not just with the uh, pre-existing Luke dictionaries, but also with uh, dictionaries that are specifically meant to measure moral concerns, namely the moral foundations uh, theory dictionary and the morality is cooperation dictionary. You may be familiar with the moral foundations theory, uh, if you're even if you're not familiar with its dictionary. This is the view that's put forward by Jonathan Haidt, among others, that there are sort of five main domains to which people are morally sensitive, including um, care, purity, authority, um, sanctity, uh, and so on, uh, fairness. Um, and that different people are differentially uh, attuned to, to, to different of these five. Um, Mac is a sort of, I, th I think, more theoretically defensible version of the same view that posits that there are seven domains. Uh, it's founded in game theory. Uh, I can talk more about that during the Q and A if you want to hear about it. But basically, the the main takeaway here is that. Um, these groups didn't just shift the way they used, for instance, first person singular pronouns, first person plural pronouns, they also shifted their moral concerns. So whereas before the pandemic, public health and anti-vaxxers um, essentially shared the same moral concerns, but had sort of disagreed about the facts on the ground, leading them to, um, leading them to different um, conclusions about what should be done. And likewise, uh, Democrats and Republicans shared a lot of the same concerns, even if they disagreed about the facts on the ground, what should be done. After the pandemic struck, the moral concerns of Republicans and anti-vaxxers coalesced with each other, whereas the moral concerns of public health Democrats and the socialists coalesced with each other. So th this suggests, I think, that um, it's really important to be careful who we trust uh, because that can have a kind of transformative effect uh, uh, on our beliefs and concerns uh, and values. Trust seems to come first, uh, not deciding whether someone is trustworthy, not deciding whether someone is honest, not deciding whether someone is well-informed, but rather getting attached to someone comes first. And then once that attachment is formed, it can warp uh, or, or alter the moral concerns that um, and values that we uh, embody and express. Okay, I see that I'm running a little low on time, so uh, I'll go through this example, and I might not uh, give the last example. Um, so this example is actually the paper that uh, Gloria mentioned uh, uh, in the introduction. 
Uh, it's the, the paper that won the uh, Parizia Prize uh, last year. Um, and the basic idea here is to kind of operationalize at the level of the individual node in a network, the ability to benefit from the wisdom of crowds. And if you're familiar with that literature, you know that someone benefits from the wisdom of crowds when they have multiple diverse independent sources. So what we tried to do was figure out, okay, in this vaccine discussion, in this vaccine discourse, um, to what extent are the various nodes actually in a position to benefit from multiple independent diverse sources? Um, you can sort of see why you would want that. So you might uh, think, well, you're better off if you've got one informant than no informants. Um, and you might think, well, you're probably better off if you have four informants than if you have just one informant. So that starts to get us to the multiple uh, sources. Um, but you might think, well, it also depends on whether those sources are um, independent of one another. So if I'm the red node and I'm getting fed information from these three purple nodes, but each of them is getting its information from just one place, then it might feel to me as if I've got four different voices telling me something, but really I've just got one voice here, the blue, um, and one other, the purple over here that I, I don't even know about, but which is getting amplified at me at, uh, at three X. So what we would really like um, in order to benefit from the wisdom of crowds is to have uh, multiple sources that are also independent of each other. Uh, and that's something that we define mathematically in the paper. Um, I, can, I can go into the details of that, but you can sort of, I, I think already see essentially what it looks like uh, from this graph. Uh, the orange node is independent of the blue node because they're not in communication with each other either directly or indirectly, whereas the purple nodes uh, are, are barely independent of each other because they're all getting fed by, uh, by this one over here. Um, and in that paper, uh, we found that uh, only very few uh, nodes in this network actually are in a position to benefit from the wisdom of crowds, essentially only the ones that get over this little um, get over the red line here. So most of them fall far below it. So that's a bit depressing. Um, the moral of the story here is be careful who you trust. Uh, they might not be meaningfully independent, uh, even if they do seem independent because they're different people. Um, the last one I'll just summarize briefly uh, because I think I still have a couple minutes. Um, this one has to do with algorithmic bias uh, and it's a study of YouTube. So basically, uh, if you've gone on YouTube, you probably have noticed that once a video ends, uh, the next video plays automatically. That's at least the default setting. And actually that recommender system drives something like three quarters of all watch time on YouTube. So it's hugely influential. People sort of implicitly trust it, even if they don't know that that's what they're doing. And we were a bit worried that um, the recommender system could end up uh, promoting conspiracy theories because these are highly engaging. Uh, essentially, the uh, recommender system is optimized to show you things that you're going to watch all the way through because then you get to the end and then you also watch the next one. Um, and as it turns out, conspiracy theories are uh, highly engaging. They keep capture and keep people's attention. Uh, and so in order to serve people ads, um, uh, it's, it's uh, convenient as a side effect to show them conspiracy theories, if, even if you're not trying to promote those directly. So essentially what we did was we had uh, a bot watch all of the videos that got recommended for various topics. And then the next ones that got recommended from those and the next ones that got recommended from those. And it went five layers deep. And we coded the resulting videos based on whether they promoted conspiracy theories, either not at all, uh, yeah. a little bit, uh, or uh, in a really pernicious way that's kind of unfalsifiable by saying that powerful forces try to influence the topic under discussion and also distort all evidence of their activities, meaning that there's no way that you could ever show that they weren't there. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I'll just skip to the, the main result here. Uh, depending on the topic, uh, as much as half of the most recommended videos um, promoted conspiracy theories. Um, so that to me is a pretty disturbing result. Um, and it suggests that um, we need to be careful about how these algorithms are working in addition to being careful about uh, sort of the individuals that we trust or the institutions that we trust uh, or the degree of open-mindedness that we manage to embody. And with that, I will uh, apologize again and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for this uh, fascinating and interdisciplinary lecture. So we have touched upon so many, so many issues. And I see Maria with a, a hand raised. Maria, would you like to ask your question now? And then we go, Maria is among the panelists, and then we go uh, through the Q&A. Uh, to, through the questions we have received through the Q&A. Maria? Uh, to... Thank you, Gloria. I'll come back uh, because I see that there are other questions, so I'll give priority to questions. Thank you very okay. much. That's great. So let's uh, go through the questions we received. Um, Marinos Ferreira asks, uh, uh, could you say something more about why open-mindedness would go against accepting conspiracy theories? One of the major self-reported drivers for belief in conspiracy theories is a willingness to change your mind away from official explanations. And many people respond to conspiracy theorizing by noting that we should at least consider tamping down or having this discussion in public at all uh, people, including yourself, your co Christina Bicchieri, who's going to present uh, in this uh, lecture series, and your co-author, Neil Label. So what's the, the relationship between open-mindedness and uh, uh, going against accepting conspiracy theory, Mark? Yeah, it's a good question. So there's a, a sort of slogan you sometimes hear, which is don't be so open-minded that your brain falls out of your head. Um, and you might think you know, that, that open-mindedness would actually be associated with ex Oh, you're frozen again, let's wait. The open-minded person would say, what? sorry? You, you were frozen for a few minutes. If you can just repeat what? Uh... Uh, yeah, sure. Sorry, my connection's so bad. Um, it's Australia. Um, so th there's a, a slogan uh, that says, um, don't be so open-minded that your brain falls out of your head. Um, and you might think that, you know, there's a way. Associated with gullibility um, and accepting any old thing that you hear. Um, as it turns out, um, the scale that we developed um, there, there was recently a longitudinal use of it that showed that very early on in the pandemic, open-mindedness was in fact associated with accepting some conspiracy theories, um, but that the very same people later on were the ones who consistently rejected conspiracy theories. So it seems like these are people who are, as you say, willing to update, but they are not rigid in the way that the epistemic vice scale measures. And so they don't just jump to a conclusion and stay there. They, they sort of adjust over time uh, and they at least make some effort to ensure that they're getting good evidence from reliable sources rather than um, just listening to people who tell them what they wanna hear. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Mark. And there is a second question by Francis Remedius who asks, how do alt-right news networks, such as Breibart, for example, uh, influence alt-right networks? Um, they seem to mostly do so by uh, agenda setting. So they have um, networks of, uh, not just with their own journalists, but um, affiliated, uh, 
journalists say at Fox, uh, the Daily Caller and various others, uh, they, they tend not to fact check each other and only to signal boost each other. And the ownership structures of these corporations are, are extremely dodgy. So for instance, if you look at Tucker Carlson and the Daily Caller, um, he's a co-owner, or used to be at least a co-owner of the Daily Caller. So what would happen would be the Daily Caller would publish something, he would monologue about it on his show on Fox, and then the Daily Caller would cover his monologue as if it were news, right? So you, you're getting this lack of independence um, at the level of structures uh, of ownership. Um, and you're also getting lack of independence in the sense of unwillingness to fact check. Um, I can highly recommend the book um, Network Propaganda by Benkler uh, and his two colleagues from Harvard, uh, where they, they explore this in a lot of detail and specifically look at the role of Breitbart in, um, uh, in the 2016 US presidential election. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Mark. And we have a third question by Andre, Andre Gareyev, uh, who asks, um, as we see the lack of trust in digital networks uh, online, how did this digitalization of networks affect the way we trust offline in everyday face-to-face -face communication? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, so I think that because the online space is new and because it's easy to measure, there's been a lot more attention to it than to say traditional media or to conversations people have at the bar or at church or wherever. Um, so I think it's actually not at all clear that the digital space is worse than um, these other spaces when it comes to the spread of misinformation. Um, in fact, uh, in the Bankler book that I just mentioned, um, the, the conclusion is that really it's talk radio and cable news that are the problem and not Facebook and Twitter. Um, so it, it's part of the problem is that getting the relevant data uh, with these, especially with radio, is essentially impossible. Um, with, with Twitter, you can use the API and get basically everything. Um, but with radio, you just know that the signal went out and you don't know who, tu who tuned in. With cable news, you can, if you are willing to pay a lot of money, you can start to get that kind of data. Um, but it's, uh, it's quite onerous compared to the, the online investigation. And so I think that there's been kind of a glut of attention paid, including by myself, um, to, to, for instance, social media uh, when traditional media is, is at least as much to blame. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Maria, do you want to uh, ask your question now that uh, we have a... Yes, uh, Mark, do you have any data on the network effect on distrust, you know, spread of distrust rather than trust? That's an interesting question. Um, so a lot of people try to measure distrust in terms of polarization. And what we've seen, not just with the vaccine data, but also with other stuff like um, we've been tracking the, the discourse on Twitter about the Black Lives Matter um, protests is that what you actually get is something a bit more complicated. You get simultaneously polarization and depolarization within the polarities. So um, you'll get like left-wing politicians and activists moving closer together to each other while they move further from the far right. And you'll see the far right and, and anti-vaxxers move closer together to each other while they also move further from say public health and, and the political left. Um, so it, it seems like there's this kind of hydraulic thing going on where um, the, it, it's almost like the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of reasoning where, where people decide, okay, well, I don't like them, I distrust them. 
I'm going to pull away from them and then look around for anyone else who's doing the same and cling together with, with those others who are pulling away. Thank you. That's fascinating. I think there are more questions. Yeah, there are uh, some more questions. One from Jack Morgan Jones, who asks, uh, on the thera uh, therapeutic criticism of O'Neill Maxim, can you speak to the normative implications on how we should actively build networks that trust online, especially to combat the problem of talk radio, for example? Yeah, that's, that's really hard. So the thing with therapeutic trust is that it works best, or at least it, it's only really been discussed in the philosophical literature in the context of quite close personal relationships where people you know, meet up in person, they look each other in the eye, um, they, they have an ongoing relationship, they know each other by name, um, they might have friends in common and so on and so forth. Um, that's the kind of context where therapeutic trust is most likely to work because if I don't know who you are and you say you trust me, I can just kind of shrug and be like, okay, I, whatever, if some stranger believes me or something. Yeah. Um, whereas if someone I know and care about is like, look, I'm putting my trust in you right now, now that, that that's going to affect me a bit. Um, and you need to get that reaction if you're going to get therapeutic trust off the ground because um, it's, it's meant to be almost like a, a transformative thing where someone is like, you know what, if this person believes in me, maybe I do deserve to be believed in. And the online space is just terrible for that. So um, I am afraid I'm not really answering your question, except to say that it's it's unlikely to happen uh, in these large anonymous or pseudonymous um, interactions online. No, that's very interesting. And I have a little follow up on this, but uh, given that we are in, in, uh, in uh, online, I mean, uh, we are um, uh, in, uh, um, uh, we are in connection with friends and people who, whom we care about, uh, etc. Can uh, like I think about Facebook or Twitter? I mean, we are we are also we are connected. We are in these bubbles of of uh, people who we care about. Can it be possible that? Uh, that uh, this therapeutic, uh, therapeutic uh, trust develops in uh, online too? Yeah, you, you, might, you might think it does in, in particular contexts where people maybe have pre-existing relationships um, yeah. or where they spend enough time talking to each other online that they actually feel like they, they, they have gotten to know each other. Um, one of the things we've been looking at is, as I mentioned, is the um, the Black Lives Matter protests. I'll just briefly share my screen again. Um, so this is a network of the main emoji and hashtags that get used by um, Black activists uh, in, in this data. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of attempt to sort of um, build affiliation and signal um, a, a certain kind of trustworthiness, a kind of commitment to the same cause, solidarity with like the, the rainbow of fists, uh, the, the rainbow of hearts, um, and, and so on. So I, I think that people do try to, to mo build movements and, and build a certain kind of trust in this way um, mm -hmm. online, but it's not clear to me how effective it is. Certainly, it's got to be less effective than meeting in person. Okay, sure. Okay, so then uh, we are uh, perfectly on time. And uh, thank you very much, Mark, for this uh, rich uh, and uh, so uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, lecture on on trust and all the implication on on digital on digital networks. So we I hope we were going to become all wiser 
thanks to your <laughs> thanks to your to your data, and uh, I think that uh, you need some rest now, given it's two o'clock in the morning <laughs> in Australia, and I just uh, take uh, the opportunity to announce that we're going to have a last uh, lecture for this uh, uh, first uh, part of the year on the 15th on uh, June, with, we will going to be with Cristina Bicchieri on uh, some experiments she will present on trust and uh, your the 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 venue is uh, as for this lecture i mean the, you can register online uh, through our pe 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 perizia um, website and i hope to see you uh, there thanks uh, again uh, a lot mark and uh, have a good night <laughs> <laughs>